Grab your Bibles. Let's get ready to go to the Word. Let me pray and then we'll talk this morning. Holy Spirit, you're a wonderful God. Holy Spirit, you're a mighty God, Lord, as we share this morning. Open our hearts to hear. Open our hearts to receive, Lord, as we go to your word. I'm praying that you would speak afresh. I say this every Sunday. This morning's message was for this morning's people. This afternoon, Lord, as we share in the second service, speak afresh to these people that are here, to myself as well. Felix prepares, but Felix makes room for God to speak through me to your people, God. So say what you want said, and I move out of the way that you may be glorified. So bless and have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, prayer changes things. Amen. Point to yourself. Self, prayer changes things. That's very, very important. Now, here's a statement I want, I want to make, um, and, and listen to me once, and then, and then we can allow God to, to speak. It requires humility for us to really, truly, and authentically get to the heart of God. Amen? It requires humility. So, point to yourself and say, self, teach me humility. God, teach me humility. One more time. Say, self, God, teach me humility. That's the big picture that I want you to take away this morning from this message as we talk through it. Um, I don't have much to say, but I just want you to, I want to paint one picture that's very, very paramount and very, very um, foundational to us shifting the culture to becoming a place of prayer so we can be the prayer warriors and the intercessors that God would have us to be. But before I can move through that, I need to refresh just a little bit on what we shared. So grab your Bibles and go to the Old Testament to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Um, I just want to review uh, last week's message briefly to lay the tone so we can go into the one thing I want to share with you. And I'm going to let the scripture speak for itself. And then we're going to move into our communion service this morning that God would move and have his way. We began the series last week on the concept of the fact that prayer changes things. And we looked at a very, very, very familiar passage of scripture that most of us quote all the time where uh, what the Bible says in Second Chronicles, and we'll read that in, in a few minutes. But what was paramount in what we shared last week was the principles and the verses that led up to what Paul, I mean Solomon, was praying to God and how God responded to Solomon in his prayer. When we look at the text, a um, couple of things we saw by way of background. Number one, that you notice that Solomon had in his heart to build this temple to the Lord, um, since his daddy wasn't able to finish it. And then when he built the temple, after he brought everything into the temple, he offered a prayer of dedication. Now, I'm going to encourage you to either download the podcast, go to iTunes, get the message, so you kind of hear and get caught up or go to our website to be caught up. So I just want to review for those who may not have been here so you can have a little bit of a foreground. Once Paul, once, I keep saying Paul, once Solomon finished the temple, he offered this prayer to the Lord. Now, look with me. At verse 30, 24 of chapter 6. Let me just read a couple of verses to give you a background. He's praying about the importance of the place. And here's what Solomon says in verse 24. Notice this. He says, if your people Israel are defeated before their enemy, and don't miss the reason they were defeated, because they have sinned against you. Don't miss that, right? But then notice this. But then if they're t they turn again, and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house. Listen to the condition he puts on God. Then God, hear from heaven. Forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them again to the land that you gave them. Look at the next verse. Let me just give you one more. When heaven is shut up, verse 26 says, so there is no rain. And notice, watch again. Because they have sinned against you, if they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name, and turn from their sin, um, when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. And he goes on and on and on and on and on. So what Solomon is doing, he's laying the premise and he's laying the platform that the people of God will blow it. But when we blow it, notice what he's saying, when we turn and come back to God, he's asking God to hear the hearts of the people and to forgive them and heal their land so the people of God could be who he would have them to be. 
If you continue to read the text, you will notice that in chapter 7, God affirms to Solomon that he heard his prayer by manifesting or raining down his presence in the temple where the worship was taking place. Look at chapter 7, right? When you get to chapter 7, the first uh, three verses, it speaks to the fact that God came down, God acknowledged that the prayer was heard, he acknowledged his presence is in the place that he affirmed to these people, more uh, importantly to Solomon, that his presence was going to dwell with, with Solomon. But now, as time lapsed on, here, here's a couple of things that I want to pick up now in, in, in um, verse 12 onwards. So it's as if, here's how I said it last week, some time elapsed. God was in his bedchamber, and God comes back to visit Solomon, and he affirms to him the prayer. So notice what it says here in verse, um, let me start uh, verse 12 of chapter 7. It says this, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then notice verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, and then verse 14 comes up. But what I wanted to point out, if you look at the text carefully, you'll notice that God himself is the subject of the action of all the verbs that's taken place in these first few verses. In other words, God is saying that when you notice that the rain has ceased, when you notice that the locust is coming, when you notice that the pestilence now is upon you, um, let, let the record reflect that I am the source of these things happening, right? And you can see, you can see what all of that means and what that looks like in the text. You can read that on your own. But then the question that I would have is why would God do this, right? Why would God shut up the heavens on his people? Why would God send the locusts? Why would God send the pestilence? Why would God do all these things to people? And the response that we shared last week is real simple because the people of God have disobeyed him. Amen. Come on, say amen. Very, very important that we not miss that principle. Yes, we serve a loving God. Yes, we serve a just God. Yes, we serve a merciful God. But whenever we position ourselves outside the confines of obedience and we start disobeying God, please understand there will be consequences for our disobedience. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? There are consequences for our disobedience. And I wish the majority of you were here last week because we read a poem called Blame. Here's what happens. Whenever things go wrong in my life, I want to point that way. And I want to say, it's your fault. I want to say, you did something to me, right? And, and if I've been saved a long time, I've got my speech down well. Y'all pray for me. The devil is attacking me. Come on, y'all. And, 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 and what I'm really communicating, even though I may not overtly be stating it to you, I'm saying a lot of time the only reason the devil can access you is because of some disobedience in my life. You kind of get where I'm going? That I have been disobedient to God, so I have let my hedge down. I don't have time to go into all of that. And I've given him access. So I don't need to look that way. I need to look this way first to see what I have done that is causing me to be in the predicament and the situation that I find myself in. So here's what the text says. If I'm going to turn this thing around, I must have humility. And I wanted to capitalize humility to acknowledge my sin. I must pursue God's ways by developing a culture of prayer. And then I must change course by going in the direction of God. So let me read verse 14, then we'll talk, okay? Notice what verse 14 says. If my people... Who are called by what? My name shall do what? Humble themselves. And in my humility, I'll hit that in a little while, we pray and we seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways. Here's what God says to Solomon. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. And then he says in verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that I have made in my place. 
in this place. Go back to verse 14. So here's the solution. Here's the solution, right? If I've blown it and I've messed up and I want God to hear me and I want to get back in a right relationship with God, listen to the solution because this is the one thing I want to say. If my people, if my people. Now, I, 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 I beat this horse pretty good last week. I am not talking about unsaved individuals. I am not talking about people who don't name the name of God, but I am speaking about a call of out group of individuals that have given their lives to God who the presence of God lives within them. If those people who are called by my name, and I love this phrase, if they would humble themselves. And my challenge this morning as we kind of flesh this word out because this is the one thing I want to share with you. It seems to me that for me to have an authentic prayer that gains access to God, that requires humility. Hear me out, okay? If I go to God to pray and my pray, prayer is not prefaced with a level of humility, and I want to flesh that word out, may I be crazy enough to say that the prayer is more than likely not authentic. This is how he began. Solomon, Lord, when they mess up because they have sinned. Lord, when they lose a battle because they have sinned. If they turn, don't miss this, if they Turn. Come on, say you got to turn. turn. Say it again. Say you got to turn. If they turn, okay, because understand with me in the Old Testament, the reason Solomon built the temple is they carried around God. They carried God around in this little box, this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And it was always in a mobile situation where it was set up and it was tear down. So he located the temple. And if you read chapter 6, here's what Solomon is saying carefully. It doesn't matter where they find themselves. If they're over here, as long as they turn and face the temple, they might be back here. As long as they face the temple, he says, when they turn, God hear them. So God goes away. Then he comes comes back sometimes later and he says, okay, Solomon, I got you. Here's how we're going to do this. If my people who are called by my name, and he begins this, humble themselves. See, the reason, the reason I won't turn quite well is because at the bottom of it all, I'm not humble enough. I want you all to hear me. I'm not humble enough. Please hear me, okay? So here's what I'll do. I'll keep facing this way, and I'll point my foot that way, but I'm still... Fa- oh, don't look at me funny. You do the same thing. You kind of get what I'm saying, because here's the heart of what I'm trying to communi- communicate to you. We go to God in prayer, asking God to forgive us for a thing that we know we're not done doing it yet. Does the statement make sense? Okay? Because here's the predicament. We love sin. Can I say this, y'all? Can I say, I know, I know there's a bunch of church folk, but the reason we sin because it feels good. You kind of get what I'm saying? Can I be honest this morning, y'all? Don't nobody sin with sins that don't feel good. So y'all stop it, all right? Amen. We sin with sins that feel good. And then after the good feeling wears off, conscience steps in and the Holy Spirit says, I told you not to do that, and we feel guilty. Come on. We're convicted. But lock into this. In the conviction, we go to God for forgiveness because we feel guilty, but we know we're not done yet. Come on, y'all, because why do you think it is some of us have been saved for 30 years and we're still praying 30 years later for forgiveness for the same thing that we prayed 30 years ago, God deliver me from that. And the only reason we go is because the Spirit convicts us in it, but because we're not humble enough to literally turn from it, we fake the funk when we approach God as if he doesn't know we're faking it. Lord, I got a sexual addiction. And he probably sitting up in heaven. Didn't we talk about that in 1998? Because you wasn't done yet. You kind of get what I'm saying? 
Lord, I got a drinking problem. And he's like, didn't we start this in high school? And the reason we're still praying it is because we're not humble enough to be done yet because we don't know what humility is. We like it and we're not ready to give it up for God. And so here's what he opens up the prayer with. If my people who are called by my name shall do what? Humble themselves and then do what? Turn. You've got to walk away from the thing and don't drag it with you. You've got to leave it there. We turn, but we bring it with us. <laughs> Can we be honest this morning? We turn and we carry the thing. God, I can't get over Bubba. Stop calling him. Right? We turn, but we carry it because we don't trust God in humility. So prayer begins like this, right? If we're not humble and we've got the same thing that's been pregnant us for a long time, Grace, grace steps in, don't get me wrong, but I, I'm one of those guys that will say to you when you look at Corinthians 14, God does this. He graces you, but he knows you're faking it. Well, let me put me in there, okay, so I don't sound like I'm preaching to you. He knows I'm faking it. And so my conviction has been that if I'm going to be authentic and genuine in my prayer, it requires a high measure of humility and I must understand what humility is, first of all, if I'm going to go to God. Point to yourself and say, self, I must humble myself. One more time, say, self, I must humble myself. Okay? So repentance is a condition for answered prayer, but more importantly, it requires humility. So here's the thing. I want to share this last thing. Returning to God requires one to develop a Christ-like attitude of humility. So not humility the way the world defines it, but humility the way God modeled it. Uh, I'm going to say that one more time because I like that myself. <laughs> not humility the way the world defines it, but humility the way Christ modeled it. Does that make sense? So y'all put that back up there real quick. Put that up there real quick. Let me read this one more time. Y'all together with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Together, returning to God requires one develop a Christ-like attitude of humility. Very, very important, okay? Now, I need you to go to Philippians chapter 2. Let me show you this, and then uh, I just want to read this scripture, and then we're going to flesh this out on Wednesday night and kind of go through it and talk to it extensively. So just look at it with me and let's read this and then we'll let the scripture talk for itself and get to humility. Now let me say this one thing because we, we began this dialogue Wednesday and humility, um, this is a younger crowd so I can use this word and y'all won't get offended. Um, humility doesn't mean you got to be a Christian punk. Yeah, doesn't mean you're a wimp. Come on. Doesn't mean that, okay? It doesn't mean people step on you. Uh, very, very clear, okay? We'll flesh this out more. I want you to understand what Christ-like humility is, which is key to answered prayer. So look at chapter 2, and let's read. Look with me at um, verse 1, and I will read through this, and then we will talk. So Paul now to the church at Philippi, this is why I've been saying Paul so much. If there's any encouragement, I'm reading from the ESV, in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Look at verse 3. He's starting to define this term. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Okay? Let me say it one more time. I didn't do a good job with this this morning. I want to say it again. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Here's a first hint at a definition of humility. I know I'm right. But it's not about me. Y'all don't like that, do you? Because you want it to be about you. 
you want to win. That's fights in the relationship, right? I argue with my wife because I'm right. She should never be right. I'm the man. I think the scripture says that I ought not look at my own interests. I ought to look at what? Hers. So this seems to imply that humility means that I should be willing to be second so she can be first. That's easy to marriage, right? It's more difficult with the person you work with. <laughs> or your neighbor. Or the person on the basketball court that fouled you. Are you hearing me? Okay, so look at the text. Look at the text. I'm going to walk this out. Verse 4. Um, Let each look not to his own interests, uh, his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Verse 5. Have this mind among yourself. And I love this translation. Which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let me read again. Have this mind among yourself. I'm going to tell you what that mind is. Which is yours in Christ Jesus. One more time. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So here's what Paul is saying to the Colossian church. I'm about to tell you something. But the thing that I'm going to tell you and explain to you, you already have because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. Okay? So listen to me, guys. If you've accepted Christ in your life as personal Lord and Savior, what I'm about to tell you, you can do because Christ is in you. I want, oh, come on, come on. If, if, if we choose not, let me go back to the whole disobedience thing. It's a matter of disobedience, not ability. We all have the ability, okay, if you've accepted Christ. So here's what he says. It's yours in Christ Jesus. Now let's go. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man and being found in a human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. It says, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Paul, what are you saying to Colossians? One more time, verse 5. Have this mind um, among yourself, which is yours in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be crass, but he emptied himself and taken the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in a human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, to the point of death, um, that God, even a death on a cross, and God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. I'm done. So let me explain a couple of words. Say form. One more time, say form. Understand with me as I give you this illustration, God didn't do no wrong. You guys are all right with me? I messed up. No, I don't know how you respond. You're supposed to say, me too, preacher. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, say, me too, preacher. I know, I know your neighbor's looking at you and you don't want to know them. You're a sinner. So say, me too. I messed up. God did no wrong. The problem in the text, who's going to humble himself to fix the relationship? That's the problem that Paul is talking about. Okay? He didn't do nothing wrong. I did. And then the issue comes, who's going to fix the relationship between you and I? Right? So here's what he did. Here's what he did. God is sitting on his throne. And he's on his throne in heaven. And as he sits on his throne, just like you and I do in our homes, knowing that we have messed up relationships and we've done things wrong, and he's waiting to see who's going to fix it. <laughs> and he knows he's right because he didn't do nothing wrong. Can I talk about this for a while? So here's what he does. He looks over the earth to see which one of these humans is going to take the initiative to fix it. Then he couldn't find nobody because all y'all like me. Y'all mess up too. So lock into what he did. The first word form in the text speaks to the very essence of his deity. So it's the word morphe in the Greek, right? 
And here's what the, the, that word speaks to the very essence of the thing that makes the thing what it is. So Paul says this, have this mind in you, which was the same as in Christ Jesus. Though he was God himself. Yeah. Ah, you got to lock this. Though he was God himself, because notice the words, he didn't think competition or equality with God that was something to be grasped at. So here he is, wrapped up inside of God, and, and my problem with the, the Trinity and your problem with the Trinity is we know three persons in one God, but we make the mistake of when we see Jesus and we see God and we see the Holy Spirit, we want to separate them, though they're not, I wish I had somebody in here, though they're not separated. So here's what it says, though being in the form of God, so here's God on heaven saying, who's going to fix this? And he couldn't find nobody. So what does he do? While he's on his throne, he steps out of himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he stands there outside of himself even though he's still sitting, I wish I had somebody on the throne. And he puts himself there. Come on now. Knowing that I've got to right this wrong. Then he reaches down and he takes dirt. And listen to the second word, schema. The outer form of a thing. And so he fashions this thing that looks like a man. Oh, you got to get this. And he creates it in the form of a man. And then he takes himself and he places himself inside this thing that looks like a man. I wish I had somebody. And then he shrinks it down to an embryo and he places it inside of Mary and says, be born on the earth. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. And the reason he did all that, then he goes to this cross. And he pays the price for sin. He dies the death of a cross. Listen, y'all, that's equivalent to the electric chair. That's a death he did not deserve. I wish I had somebody. That's the lowest form of death. Why did he do all that? Not because he did anything wrong, but because I did. And he humbled himself Lock into this to repair the relationship that was broken when I was guilty the whole time. That's a different level of humility because here's what humility means to me. I'm going to say holy, I'm going to stay sanctified, and I'm going to pray to you so God could touch your heart to bring you to a relationship with me. And God is saying, that's not how I do it. I initiate even though I'm right. You got to get that. You got to get that. And if you wrong me, this is what I mean. God forgive me. But I know I'm going to do it again because it felt good. Because I haven't turned yet. I want to stay in the right. And Paul is saying to the Philippian church, humility is you got to be wrong even though you're right. To fix the relationship so God can hear you. Lord have mercy. He didn't do nothing wrong. And this is my argument with you. And you argument with me, you wrong me. You wrong me. So I go to pray every day. I'm fasting for God to fix the relationship because I really like you. But he got to show you how you wrong me so you can come to me and make it right. He shagabah hashanda God, heal them. Touch their heart, make them right. And God is sitting up in heaven because he's saying, that's not how I do it. He said, I didn't do it like that for you. So why you want them to do it like that for you? That ain't how it works. He says, listen, did not fashion you out of dearth like I did my son. And that salvation did not go in you like I did my son. So you have everything you need to be like me in the earth. I wish I had. Are you all getting this? Come on. So, so why you want to define humility the way the world does? Why can't you do it the way I did? If my people who are called by my name shall what? Yeah, you know 
it, you know it, you know it. But the problem is our definition of humility doesn't look like how God modeled it. We define humility. I love God. I'm going to be right. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to even say, Lord, the devil attacked me at work, and that girl got on my nerves. So y'all pray for her that she get that thing right. And God is saying, I died for you. Aren't you willing to die for her? And you wonder why your land isn't healed? Because here's what happened. They don't know what my death looks like, so they're looking at you, and when they don't see you die, they call you hypocritical. Because you want me to die for you, but you don't want to die for them. Right? And I love this part because I messed up, y'all. Yeah, no, I messed up. Don't look at me funny. You did too. Yeah, yeah, you did too. And, and, and what I love about this, right, he goes to Calvary and he didn't do no wrong. He didn't do nothing wrong. I was the culprit that was wrong. I was wrong. And then when he got up from that grave three days later, and he goes back to the Father and he says, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I raised my hand. I want to come. I want to come. And he says, come. And when I came to him, here's what he didn't do. He didn't come to me and says, you remember that time when you lied? Remember that time when you wronged me? Remember that time when you cut me off in that left lane and then you stuck your, anyway, anyway, bless your Lord. <laughs> your five hands and said hallelujah, amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You remember that time? When I came to him, he didn't remind me of what I did that severed the relationship. Are oh, you not ready for this? You're not ready for this because you've been waiting for the moment so you can tell him. <laughs> that's not how God defines humility think about it I'm not saying there's not a moment where you got to have that crucial conversation but the thing we want to do is we want to remind people of where they were when God didn't remind us of where we were when we came to him the reason the only reason we want to do that is to make sure listen to this they don't do it again that's not the condition on which we came to Christ, right? If you confess your sin, he's what? Faithful and just to do what? Forgive you and to do what? Cleanse you. So he knows you're going to do it again and he's willing to forgive again. And the reason we give up on people when they do it three times is because we don't understand what humility is. There's a sense of forgetting in the forgiveness. So he treats me like a son. Here's us. I'll forgive you. And tell you what she did, so watch her. She did it to me, she'll do it to you. Just watch her. And the person can't be what God would have them to be, not because of God, not because of them, because I'm not humble. You get it? Does this make sense? If my people who are called by my name shall act like God, maybe he should have said that, it would have been a little easier. Humble themselves. And I love the fact that Paul said to the church at Philippi, you can do it because God is in you. You just got to die. You just got to die, right? You just got to die. But Sister Annie, I ain't willing to die for you. I don't love you like that. You get it? But I expect God to love me like that such that he dies for me. What hypocrites. I'm talking by myself, not y'all. Amen. You kind of get what I'm saying? How hypocritical. How hypocritical. And I want God to hear me? That's not authentic prayer. You see how heavy this thing is? It's not authentic prayer. If I want to be truly authentic, it seems that I've got to be like Christ and love my neighbor. Two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it. Love your what? Neighbor as yourself. Wow. Seems like God loved me that way that he gave himself. Right? So here's a connection with communion, right? Um, Second Chronicles, he said this thing. Then in Corinthians, he says it this way, right? Um, let a person examine himself. Corinthians 11, thinks 26. And let him discern the, bar, the Lord's body. So let him eat and let him drink. For he that eats and drink in an unworthy manner does not discern the Lord's body. Here's what that means. 
before we come to the table, this is why Paul said that to the Corinthians. Think about what Jesus did for you. And make sure you're willing to do it for others. Think about what Jesus did for you. And make sure you're willing to do it for others. Before you identify with him in his death and resurrection. Think about what he did with you. And be willing to do it for somebody else. Man, that changes prayer, isn't it? That changes prayer, right? Here's how Jesus said in the New Testament. When you come to the altar to offer your gift, and there you remember you have art with a brother. Y'all know it. Leave your gift there and go make it right. The problem is we come this way. Well, Lord, I was waiting for them to come to me, and they ain't there came, so here's my tithe. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. I was up in heaven waiting for a long time. <laughs> and you never came. Matter of fact, you didn't have capacity to come. Because you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So I initiated and I went to you. What are you waiting on? And you want me to hear you? Lord, help us all. Bow your heads with me. Musicians, come bow your heads with me. I want you to take a moment like your pastor has been doing all week. Wow, Lord, this word is sharper than a two-edged sword, man. The vibe's going in and coming out. This is convicting. What does this look like in my marriage? Well, don't wait for Katai to come and get it right. You get it right. Don't wait for Eddie or Veronica or Gerald to get it right. You get it right. Dang, Lord, what does that look like in my ministry? Well, don't wait for the elders to get it right. You get it right. Don't wait for the ministers to get it right. You get it right. Don't wait for the deacons to get it right. You get it right. That's what it looks like. Lord, what does that look like on the workplace? Don't wait for your coworker to get it right. You get it right. You get it? What does that look like in my neighborhood? You get it right. Because you're me in the earth. So God, forgive me for missing it. Forgive me for not really understanding what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says when it calls on the first principle to be that of humility. I've got to humble myself and look not to my own needs, but the needs of others above myself and develop the mind of Christ. So God, forgive me. Forgive us as a church. Forgive us individually as people. Forgive us in our interpersonal relationships. Forgive us, forgive us as we engage the world. Forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, God. We want to be like you. We repent. And we covenant to make this place a place of prayer, but it must begin with humility. Grow us there. Grow us there. Grow us there. Take a moment to go to God in your own way. Then we're going to come to the Lord's table. Take a moment. Take a moment to go there. Holy Spirit, have your way, Lord. The good news in the message is that you love us. And you initiated the process. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Teach us humility. In your name we pray. Amen.